Uh, welcome to my first session of the talks. Um, I want to thank the organizers, uh, Denise and Andre, uh, for uh, putting this conference together. Um, it's just very great to see so many women in quantum in one place. Um, today, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, trapped ion quantum computer and uh, for how we went from research to marketplace. My name is Patty Lee. I'm the chief scientist at Honeywell Quantum Solutions. Um, and uh, I'll also talk about my personal journey, uh, which is uh, also part of the trapped ion quantum computer evolution. Um, here we have pictures of uh, our hardware um, from cryo to vacuum um, to some electronics. And uh, we use our lasers to uh, manipulate our ions to do quantum operations. And in the middle here is our actual trap that we use in our commercial system. Um, and that is a key enabler for uh, what we do. Let's see. So um, Honeywell has decades of experience um, in different air technology areas that are quite relevant uh, to trapped ion quantum computing hardware. Um, you can see here. Um, uh, but the technology itself is not enough. Uh, we have uh, also need uh, people to make this happen. So uh, we have a team of more than 100 uh, technologists um, to, uh, to make uh, uh, scientists and engineers uh, in the field of uh, atomic molecular optical physics, theoretical physicists, um, quantum information, and also in many engineering areas like electrical, mechanical, optical, uh, and software, and etc. Um, I'm going to call, hold on, I'm going to pause and make sure um, this is. So, okay, I think this is working. Um, and uh, my role as a chief scientist here um, is to coordinate all the efforts of this team of uh, 100 plus people um, and to make sure that uh, our efforts come together um, to build the best quantum computers we can and make it accessible to people to use. Um, now, uh, we also are developing technology that are necessary uh, so we can continue to scale up and improve our systems for future generations of uh, quantum computing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, subject mat matter experts on our team, um, we, and we want to make sure everyone put forth their ideas uh, and pick the best approach based on science. So um, certainly I provide technical input um, like everybody else on the team, but we let the data and science drive the technical decisions. Um, and in order to go fast, um, to compete in this quantum uh, uh, community, um, we want to develop different. We try to develop different parts of the hardware uh, in parallel by uh, having many development systems, uh, development test beds, um, so we can prototype and try out different ways to do things. Um, so we can rapidly uh, iterate um, on our designs. And as soon as we have a good design, we can integrate into our commercial systems when that's ready. So uh, we recently released our uh, very first commercial system. Uh, it's called Model H0, um, and it's based on trapped ion uh, uh, qubits. Uh, it uses a quantum CCD architecture, has six qubits, it's a quantum volume of 64, which is a world record. Um, it's twice as, uh, high, as large as the next uh, highest quantum volume machine. Um, we have high fidelity gates and long coherence times. And our system also has special, special capabilities like all-to-all -all connectivity. And we can make high resolution uh, single qubit gates. Um, and we can have this very unique uh, way of do uh, uh, keep, um, function feature called mid circuit measurement, where we can stop in the middle of a computation uh, to measure one of the qubits, 
Um, and depending on the result, uh, change the logic operation we apply to the other qubits. Um, so uh, this is what we're very proud of for uh, uh, this uh, system, but uh, this didn't happen by accident. Uh, this took years of planning and ex execution. Um, and before that, uh, even before Honeywell started uh, planning and building the system, uh, many of the scientists on our team have been uh, working on the fundamental research behind this technology. And so um, I'm going to show some of the performance uh, benchmark we were able to do on this machine. Um, the, we the, this quantum volume benchmark uh, was actually um, a, uh, uh, a scheme that was proposed by IBM uh, because uh, back a few years back, uh, they realized that number of qubits uh, is it wasn't adequate to tell the story of how good uh, your quantum computer is doing. And so um, most of the time, uh, our quantum computers are really limited by the errors on the system. And so uh, in this quantum volume benchmark, uh, the system has to be able to perform uh, quantum programs with depth that are equal to the number of effective qubits uh, with a, some reasonable probability of getting the, to the right answer. And so it's a very stringent test. Um, and uh, we uh, ran the, the um, quantum volume uh, uh, algorithm from the Qiskit uh, from IBM. And we show here in this plot that uh, with six qubits, uh, we were able to execute programs with depth six and uh, be able to test, pass the test uh, with uh, very little trouble there. And in fact, our error rates are good enough that we can probably increase the, uh, a few more qubits in the future um, at that same error rate and still and be able to expand our quantum volume. And so the key enabler to our, our system being able to perform uh, such high fidelity operations and get uh, such a high performance is this uh, quantum CCD architecture. Um, it has dedicated zones. Um, so here's a, a schematic of our ion trap. Um, you can see the ions sort of live on this rail um, and the different zones are color coded. Um, those little boxes are our uh, trapped ion, our trapped electrodes, um, and, and so um, these de in these dedicated zones, uh, we can perform op gate operations. Um, we can keep the ions in very short chains, so we can perform high fidelity quantum gates on them. And the ions are transported from zone to zone. Uh, and our compiler will handle all of that automatically once you send us the uh, quantum program. And so uh, it's not a new idea. Uh, in fact, uh, this idea has been around since the uh, early, late 90s. Um, and here's a paper uh, from 2002. Um, it was one of the first demonstrations of uh, transporting ions in a trap, and this work was actually done by one of our, by Mary Rowe, who's one of our uh, uh, scientists on our team. Um, and so we've made a lot of improvements over the years, and so uh, now we can do all these transports a lot better um, and allow us to uh, get a much better performance on our machine. Um, so next I'll show you an algorithm that uh, was demonstrated on our uh, model H0 by our, one of our customers. Um, and this is the Grover search algorithm, which gets you quadratic speed up compared to classical search algorithm. And so um, just a little bit of historical perspective here. Um, the first demonstration of uh, Grover's algorithm on trapped ions was in 2005. And uh, <clears throat> this was done uh, by uh, my good friend, Kathy M. Brickman Soderberg, uh, and myself, among others. Um, and uh, back then, we only had two qubits. And we, uh, in each one of these uh, set of data, we marked one of the, um, one of the qubit states 
and then we perform Grover search algorithm on it to get the date, get the to see if we can find it. As you can see, um, we found the 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 mark state correctly, um, and uh, and so that was very nice for two thousand five. But uh, now uh, this paper that was just published in uh, by a group in J at J.P. Morgan Chase uh, show that uh, right, show them running the uh, Grover's algorithm on our H zero machine on uh, four qubits, um, and uh, you can see that uh, the data is a lot cleaner and there are a lot more states you can search. Um, and as they show the simulation. Um, of different, a couple of different methods that they uh, employed, and then the actual uh, measurement from the model H0. And so uh, the mark state here is very clearly above the, uh, the, the rest of the um, other states. And so this Grover search algorithm really works on our machine as, as predicted. So um, this is where we are today. Um, and uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're very glad to be able to offer this uh, capability to our customers um, so that uh, other people get to play around with our quantum computers. Um, and uh, so now I will move on to tell you a little bit about how I got into uh, how um, I got into quantum computing and uh, how we got here. I, we got here personally, uh, which is a little bit intertwined uh, with the history of trapped ion quantum computer. So uh, when I was preparing uh, for this talk, um, Den Denise uh, asked, said she wa told me she wanted to know what who I wanted to be when I grow up, and um, I have to say I didn't think a physicist uh, was possible. Um, I always loved math and science, and I didn't think I would. But uh, um, when I was when I started uh, as a freshman at Caltech, I didn't think my um, background, uh, my my uh, public school education in science uh, was enough uh, to get me through the physics major program there, which is very um, uh, very rigorous. Um, but a but a bunch of friends convinced me to try it out. Um, and I did, and uh, I actually enjoyed it very much. Um, but at the time, uh, even though there are lots of uh, professors there uh, doing some amazing work in quantum, uh, I was actually involved in nuclear physics, um, working at, at uh, accelerators um, and uh, uh, figuring out to you know smash electrons into protons. Um, and also doing some work for building this anti-neutrino detector uh, it, for Camland. Um, and so I really enjoyed it. Um, but in, uh, as I was, uh, started grad school um, at University of Michigan, I decided, well, maybe I want something a little simpler uh, rather than these large, large accelerator physics. Um, I prefer something's tabletop. It's a lot easy. It should be a lot simpler to manage, um, a lot easier to run. And so um, atomic physics seems like a good idea. And somebody said, um, why, you know, somebody recommended that I talk to this new professor at Michigan named Chris Monroe. Uh, and some of you may know uh, Chris Monroe is also the co-founder of IonQ, uh, which is also making trapped ion uh, quantum computer hardware. And so um, this is the picture of my very first ion trap. Uh, there's uh, literally, we just punch some holes uh, in a couple pieces of metal um, and uh, put it in the vacuum can, connect it up. And here's a picture of my of two ions. Uh, these are cadmium ions um, from my uh, PhD work. Um, and at the time, um, there were a lot of theorists that were proposing different robust gate schemes um, and for ion trap. Uh, and so an experimentalist were trying to uh, implement them uh, and to prove out that they work. Um, and one particular scheme really stood out, which was uh, this, uh, one that was proposed by uh, so Momer and Sorensen. Um, and it seemed really promising as a robust gate, 
but people were struggling with uh, keeping the qubits in phase um, while the system, uh, while the gate operation uh, is applied. And so, um, me as a, uh, when as a as a graduate student, um, I was just trying to figure this out. Um, and uh, it took a few years to understand that really all these different gate schemes uh, are based on the same concept of applying a spin-dependent force to entangle the qubits. Um, and they look very different uh, in, uh, on what it does to the qubits, but it's only because they're applying the spin-dependent force on different qubit bases. And if you just convert your bases from your, your typical zero and one to some X or Y bases, then, um, then really the physics is all the same. And so that led to uh, some understanding of how at the, uh, this phase uh, sensitivity on the, uh, of this gate uh, based on the geometry of your laser, you know, whether you have beams coming in uh, in uh, certain directions or not. Um, and so uh, we're able to show that in one configuration, you're sensitive to the optical phase of your laser. Another configuration, you can remove that phase. Um, and that allows us to do um, this quantum computation and maintain that qubit phase for a long time. Um, before this uh, was done, um, people were starting to give up on this molmer sorensen gate. Uh, and now this gate is still being used in our Honeywell uh, H0 system, uh, as well as uh, by IonQ and other uh, most other, lots of other uh, trapped ion research groups. And so, um, you know, we've made some advances. This, uh, you know, this, this space, phase space walk uh, got a little fancier, you know, rather than perfect circles, we have ellipses, rectangles, even heart shaped uh, things or multiple circles, um, but the physics is all the same. And I didn't go, so I got my PhD uh, doing trapped iron work. Um, and, uh, but I didn't go straight from ac academic research uh, into building commercial systems. Um, back then, there was D-Wave, um, and maybe some other companies are starting to do that. Um, but um, really, there wasn't, a, a comer there, was, there wasn't any trapped iron quantum computing in the commercial space. So um, I uh, decided that I wanted to go and work with neutral atoms um, because I learned about uh, these uh, new novel phase called Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, they're the coldest thing on in the universe at you know a few nanocalvins above absolute zero, and I thought that would be awesome. And this uh, group at uh, NIST Gaithersburg happens to be working on uh, quantum computing uh, with neutral atoms. So uh, I joined group as a postdoc. And we did, while I was there, we did the first demonstration of entangling gates in neutral atoms in the optical lattice. So we have this double well lattice, and you can see here, um, where we can have atoms in left and right well. Um, and we can address these individual atoms uh, on the sides and do single qubit rotation arbitrarily on each one of those. And then we can bring them together by deforming this double well lattice and their interaction creates entanglement. Um, and it actually pretty neatly maps onto a square, what's called a square root of swap gate, uh, where the, uh, the, these atoms, atomic qubits, uh, can uh, swap back and forth between the two different states. And if you stop in the middle, that square root of swap is entangling. So here's the data that shows that we have that entanglement. And then here's the data that shows the, how we can map out uh, our qubits uh, in the atoms um, with these pretty little, pretty pictures. Um, one of the, um, the, the, um, the postdoc on this uh, experiment, Jenny Strabley, uh, is also now also uh, working at Honeywell uh, in Honeywell Aerospace. Um, and I'm very fortunate to, to get to do this uh, mm -hmm. with the group. And then um, after my postdoc, I continued with uh, cold atom, working with cold atom research. Um, and so I got, had a, got a position at uh, Army Research Lab. Um, and uh, we 
and uh, we had um, uh, we're, and we looked at different uh, cold atom applications uh, in quantum sensing and quantum communications. Uh, he, so here are a couple articles I pulled from the website um, talking about the research work we did. Um, and so here's a picture of my lab, um, our lab and our t group. Um, and uh, at the time we had uh, um, fiber going from our lab running a few miles down the road to University of Maryland. And we were, uh, we were passing entangled photons uh, from the two sites, between the two sites. Um, and my colleague here, uh, Kutsia Qureshi, um, is now uh, still leading that group. Um, and she's uh, recently uh, entangled a barium ion with uh, a photon and was able to convert that photon into telecom wavelengths and so that we can, it can be sent down the, uh, the fiber. So that was very exciting, a lot of fun. Um, what I learned from this experience uh, working at NIST and at Armin Research Lab is, um, you know, it's different than uh, the academic environment. And so each place has different missions. They have their objectives. Um, even though I, I was doing fundamental research, um, it's really important that uh, the work we do is really aligned to the organization's mission. And so uh, while I was playing with uh, neutral atoms, um, the field of quantum computing kind of continued to move on and companies started investing in quantum computing. And so we have new stories like this one on the left. Uh, that says, uh, at, from, that, from that time, uh, we, this one's announcing that Lockheed Martin is partnering with the uh, University of Maryland uh, to form a quantum engineering center. And that, around that time, Honeywell also started microfabricating ion traps um, in collaboration uh, with Georgia Tech Research Institute. Um, and people were talking about building quantum computers like D-Wave does, um, but just with different technologies like trapped ions and superconducting qubits. Um, and so I was aware of all those things going on, um, but I really wasn't actively thinking about switching career um, until a friend called and asked, hey, how would you like to work in industry for a while? And so um, when I said, well, I haven't thought about it, but um, please tell me more. Um, and uh, one thing led to another. Um, and so I ended up working with uh, uh, working at Lockheed Martin for a few years um, before finally ending up uh, at Honeywell. Um, people have asked me uh, why I work for Honeywell. Um, and the answer is simple. It's really about the people. I really enjoy working with the people uh, on the team. Um, they're very smart and I'm very knowledgeable, uh, very talented, um, and also motivated. Um, but uh, the most important thing is that they put team work first. And that's really key. Um, I have, um, in, you know, we get enormous support uh, from the leadership uh, and on down. Um, and I really appreciate uh, everything that uh, the company and and everybody on the team has done to make this possible. Um, and here are some of the women on our team, not all of them, because I didn't get everybody's picture on here. Um, but uh, I want to point out um, a couple of people, uh, Joan Dryling and uh, um, Caroline Fickett, uh, who are on the H0 integration team. And they really drive to uh, make this uh, commercial system possible. Uh, for for our customers. And I also want to thank the optics team uh, that uh, for um, making the lasers and optics work. Um, it's a lot of effort to uh, uh, to put it all together and, and keep it running well. Um, and uh, they, did, uh, uh, they, they did a fantastic job. I also want to point out a few of the um, people on the executive leadership team um, who handles legal and finance and HR and other functions uh, that supports our, our operation um, that makes it possible for, uh, for things for for our commercial system. Um, and so, uh, finally, 
Um, I'm very excited about our quantum computer, um, and we will be continuing to improve the performance um, on the, our system. Uh, if you're interested in using our our quantum computers, please come talk to us. Um, and uh, it's an honor to be here. And uh, thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.